Okay, so in this video I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the factors going forward that are going to really affect the demand and then therefore the price of Bitcoin. Uh, some of these have been talked about extensively and others haven't been talked about so much. Uh, so yeah. So this is a use case that is extremely interesting. Um, so I'm sure you all remember, uh, you know, largest Ponzi scheme ever, Bernie Madoff came out in a uh, 2008. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that of those 4,800 investors uh, who were victims of Bernie Madoff, a good amount of these so-called victims actually made uh, a substantial profit if they withdrew early enough. Because um, they, they were making good returns, 10 to 15 percent returns every year, year in, year out. And um, what happened was that after the uh, Ponzi scheme came undone, uh, those people who had profited earlier on uh, were sued by the lead prosecutor in the case in order to uh, get back some of those ill-gotten gains and to distribute them to the victims who lost everything. So um, this is a scary notion, obviously. Um, a lot of these people did nothing wrong. They didn't know a scam was going on. Uh, they thought that Mr. Madoff was approved by the SEC, as did everyone else. You know, he was seen as an extremely reputable figure on Wall Street, and most of them felt like they did their due diligence as best they could. But ten years later, uh, they someone reached into their bank accounts and took money out that they thought was theirs. So. Bitcoin is safe from seizure by central authority. If you had taken those gains and put them in a cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin, uh, this would have been impossible. It could not have happened um, because they would not be able to uh, force you to give that money back. So this is very interesting. People always use the safe from seizure by central authority to say, oh, only criminals need that. Uh, a good taxpaying citizen would never need to be safe from seizure by central authority but hey a lot of these people got screwed over by it so something to think about so this one gets talked about a lot but uh the value of the remittance market and um remittances if you haven't heard of it, it's a pretty simple thing um as defined by wikipedia it's the transfer of money by a foreign worker to an individual in his or her home country so normally they send money back to family or friends um, and as you can see, we have the countries that send out the most remittances. As you can see, the United States is a huge leader in this. And then to the right of that, we have uh, the countries that are the top recipients. So where are those dollars going? Um, and this, and as you can see, um, these amounts are mostly going up by and large uh, from 2012 to 2016. Um, and basically, these people don't have a lot of good options at the moment. They're normally using something like Western Union or MoneyGram, just a type of uh, money transferring service that can take days, can have very high fees, sometimes 5 to 10% fees, although they have come down some. But basically, um, it's not an ideal way to send back close to a trillion dollars uh, back home, you know, a few percentage of a trillion dollars is enough to make these companies that are doing the transactions multi-billion dollar companies, but they're not adding enough value to be worth that. Um, so something else is um, there's been a huge push recently um, in charitable giving to uh, get to the very simple model of just direct cash giving. So uh, this goes into the thought of no one knows what poor people need as well as the poor people themselves know, you know, like who am I to tell you what you should spend your money on? Um, and uh, this kind of is on a similar train of thought to the whole UBI concept. Um, it allows you to eliminate a lot of the bureaucracy that comes with a lot of these government organizations that run welfare and things. Uh, and if we just get back to a direct cash giving, uh, these people can take care of themselves. Um, for example, instead of all the bureaucracy and costs behind the creation of food stamps we could just give those people cash and uh, they will yes some of them won't spend it on food for their families but a lot of it will go to food for their families um, so you just have to hope that people will spend money how they need it 
Um, also, there's been an increased focus uh, on the amount of the donation that is spent on overhead. So, uh, and this has been a great trend um, in the past. Charities have spent a lot of money on executive salaries, on marketing, on just any type of overhead in general that is not benefiting the people that the charity is supposed to benefit. Um, and a lot of them had low percentages, but now many of them can claim high 90% percentages. And um, this is this is a great trend. We're trying to have more efficient charities, and this is something that cryptocurrencies can add a lot, uh, add a lot to help with. And also, just third world countries don't have wire transfer capable banks a lot of the times. Um, like just a personal example, so. Um, uh, years ago, we used to take uh, a child in from Belarus during the summers to get him away from uh, the, the nuclear radiation left over from um, the, uh, the Chernobyl reactor. And um, now we, we still support their family in Belarus. Uh, but there's no good, safe way to send money. There's a lot of corruption, in the, whether it's the mailing system or other systems. And uh, money just doesn't get there. And if it does get there, a lot of it's missing. So what they have to do to this day is they strap on a money belt with $10,000 and they get on a plane and they have to bring it directly to the family. And it's just astounding to me that we still have to do something like that in 2017 uh, for us to just give to a family that we care about. So this is another area where, where cryptocurrency would help a lot. All of these people have phones, they all have internet access, um, and they could very easily receive the, these charitable donations in cryptocurrency. And as you can see, this is another industry just like the uh, the remittance industry. Uh, charitable giving is is growing over time, and uh, so this is something that will also help the use of cryptocurrencies grow over time. So this one gets talked about a ton. Uh, people always bring up these statistics, like Bitcoin is making up this tiny amount of uh, the gold market cap or this tiny amount of physical money. And if it just got to 1% or if it just got to 2%, we'd all make you know 300 times what we have right now. This, this isn't a great argument. Uh, it's definitely a lot of speculation. Uh, it's impossible to know. Uh, exactly how much the potential value of Bitcoin would be if any of these things happened. Um, these are these are people people post these uh, to just you know promote a lot of hype and stuff. Um, I think there's some truth behind it. It's just a lot harder to uh, prove. Um, and, and, and it's a lot harder to say like who's to say that someone's asset allocation should have an equal amount of gold and cryptocurrency. Who's to say it should have any gold or any cryptocurrency. But um, as people get wealthier uh, and their portfolios do go up, they are inclined to sell a lot of the stuff that's gone up a lot and to diversify just to hedge their bets. Um, maybe cryptocurrency is the next big thing. Maybe it's not. But it may be worth putting half a percent of my portfolio or a whole percent of my portfolio in there. Um, and if they did that, it would very dramatically affect the price of Bitcoin. Um, so this is stuff that gets talked about a lot, just better transactions in general. Um, so just, just some anecdotal evidence from me. Uh, I'm 23 years old, and when I travel with friends, when I go out to eat with friends, when I do any activity with friends that costs money, which is basically every activity, uh, we no longer have to exchange cash at all. Um, it's just a burden, it's a pain to keep on you. It's literally simpler to just whip out your phone and you can instantly Venmo someone uh, any amount of cash down to the cent and they can have it instantaneously. Although I believe it takes a couple of days to withdraw from, from Venmo to your bank account. Um, settlement times are minutes instead of days. So transaction times are actually instantaneous for Bitcoin, but um, the, the block size is 10 minutes. So some people like to see a few blocks uh, before they are confident that the money is truly there. Banks do this as well, but instead of a few blocks of 10 minutes, banks like to use a few days. So this is an obvious uh, benefit. Transfers, fees with a low flat rate versus percentage. It's not always a low flat rate with cryptocurrencies, but um, it is definitely more so than not. Uh, I've seen transactions in Ethereum where somebody moves $100 million for five cents. Um, and that is just truly incomprehensible um, when it comes to moving around real, real money in the real world. To move $100 million across international borders in the real world takes a lot of paperwork, it takes a lot of security, and uh, a lot of fees. 
But with Bitcoin or Ethereum moving $100 million, it's the same way that you move 10 cents. Um, so obviously I could talk about network security, uh, how secure your private key is because of how long it is, um, talk about how you'd have to control more than half the nodes to even have a small chance to hack the Bitcoin network. But um, this is a vast topic and I suggest that you watch other videos on it because it is completely fascinating. Um, and from, from everything I've seen, I'm convinced that there is not uh, sufficient evidence to believe that it would be worth hacking the Bitcoin network. So uh, the two classic cases of hyperinflation, the actual two worst recorded in human history. Uh, so the second worst was Germany after World War I paying a lot of war reparations, um, some real bad hyperinflation. As you can see, course of five years, we went from a one to one ratio with gold to a one trillion to one. Um, and that's a very scary graph. And then we have the nice picture of kids playing with uh, stacks of money. So the one worse than that is uh, Zimbabwe in 2001 to 2009. So over the course of eight years, um, it's like an 80 to one for the US dollar to uh, 10 to the 31, which is, uh, that's a number so big, I don't even know. Um, they were passing around $100 trillion notes. People had wheelbarrows for, full of cash. Absolute insanity. But I know what you're thinking, right? This is the United States. It could never happen here. So let's take a look at the next example. So the two graphs on the left um, are for Russia. So this is Russian inflation rate from 1990 to present. As you can see, after the fall of Soviet Union in 1991, they had some serious issues. 2,500% uh, uh, inflation over a year. That's basically what you have is worth nothing the next year when you have that type of inflation. You have a fraction of a percentage of what you had before. But even after things settled down from the USSR imploding um, in this lower graph starting in 1996, you can see there was still quite a few years of uh, over 20% inflation and a year over 40 and a year over 80% inflation. When you have 80% inflation for a year, uh, the value of your currency that next year or your purchasing power is only half of what it was. Imagine losing your net worth, uh, imagine losing half of your net worth over the course of a year in a country that we deem as somewhat reputable, Russia. So a more recent example is Venezuela. I'm sure you've read in the news they're having lots of issues. So this is a longer term chart from 76 to, to present. Um, and I believe this is their inflation rate against the dollar uh, as well as it is on the lower graph. So as you can see, just a few horrible years, a lot of years over 50% inflation and uh, a couple times where it was over 100%. And then recently, uh, which is not captured on this graph here. So last year, 2016, Venezuela had 800% inflation. So if you had the majority of your net worth in their currency bolivars, uh, by the start of 2017, your net worth was only one eighth of what it was. Um, and that's a very scary prospect. Uh, but still, this could never happen in the US, right? So in the upper left, uh, I have a graph of US inflation rates and it's really amazing that we've kept it as tame as we have. Um, going back as far as 1920s to 1950s, there's a few times where it's over 10%, a few times where we get close to 20. Um, and then most recently in 70s to 80, in 1970 to 1980, we had some bad, bad times, a couple, to a couple years over 10%, one year close to 15% um, up in here. But... Um, 10% inflation is nothing to uh, laugh about. Um, after 10 years, you only have half of your purchasing power at 10% inflation. Uh, it might not be the 100% that we see in some of these other countries, but it is, it is nothing to uh, scoff at. So um, another big comparison, people always talk about how uh, Bitcoin's inflation uh, procedure, like the minting of new Bitcoins, is modeled after gold or other precious metals. And um, I can see this somewhat. I couldn't find any good graphs for the inflation rate of gold, but um, you can calculate inflation very easily just by yourself. So this is a graph of uh, world gold production in tons. Uh, and as you can see, for the last 10 or so years, it's been between 2,000 and 2,500 tons per year. Um, 
and the total world gold supply is 171 uh, tons. So uh, 2.25 divided by uh, 171 is around 1.3, 1 1.4%. So that's still, pe people talk about gold being a hedge against inflation. I mean, the US dollar isn't even inflating 2% a year. So gold and the US dollar for the last 10 years have been neck and neck with in terms of uh, just increase of supply. So here's the one on Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin's inflation is mathematically defined based off of how many blocks are mined. So we're, we're currently here where each new block mined is, um, is minting 12 and a half new Bitcoins. But as you can see, uh, that begins to, to drop off over the next few uh, decades here. And the real amazing thing is that the supply uh, follows an incredible curve and reaches a flat max at 21 million. And um, this is honestly a crazy thing if you think about it. So gold, people talk about there's a fixed supply of gold, but um, we don't know what's in the earth. I mean, tomorrow we could find a huge cache of gold. We could invent a more efficient way to get gold out of the ground. Um, you know, there could be uh, a need in electronics for gold greater than what we've seen before, and that promotes increased mining. So all of these things could lead to uh, to an increase in the supply of gold, but there is nothing uh, that could increase the supply of Bitcoin. It's written into the mathematical code that there cannot be more than 21 million coins. Um, and that's a pretty powerful thing to have an asset that truly will have no inflation after a certain point. So um, the I think the big value proposition here is that People are really afraid of cryptocurrencies for two reasons. They're either afraid of them for security reasons or for volatility reasons. And I must say it is still in its infancy. And over the last 10 years of Bitcoin, the volatility has been bad. Um, if you look at if you had bought near this peak, it would have taken you 10 years or no, I'm sorry, it would have taken you two years to get back to your original purchasing power. Um, and that's very significant. You know, you, you could have lost half your purchasing power within the course of a year and that's bad um the us dollar was obviously a lot more stable than that and keep in mind this is a bias graph you know it starts at 80 and goes to 104 so this is an extremely tight range for the value of the us dollar as traded against all other currencies the us dollar has been extremely stable over this 10-year period for, for bitcoin so at the moment most people are fine losing two percent of their value a year which is the, the two percent being us inflation um when you put that against the prospect of an unknown cryptocurrency that if they don't understand the security risks, they're afraid of that. And they're also very uh, understandably afraid of the volatility around Bitcoin. So uh, the only hope for mass adoption is if we can get this volatility under control, um, as well as promoting information that tells why uh, the security risks aren't what people think they are. And the way I would think about it is this. Um, the security risk for, if you know anything about Bitcoin, are extremely low. It's extremely hard to hack the network, to lose your private keys if you do a good job of securing them. But you got to ask yourself, what's the risk of your government hyperinflating your, your currency? And if you look at a few of these historical examples that I've shown you, um, the risk is a lot higher than uh, you're, you likely think it is. So something to think about. Uh, it'll be very interesting going forwards to see what happens uh, to the price of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. Thanks for listening.